Hey everybody, tonight's video is called So Sinful and Unfaithful. And tonight we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to be looking at Judah's fallen state more deeply. So we are in the 8th chapter, and this video should go by pretty quickly. It should not be a half hour long, but we shall see. And in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, it says, At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of its princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, out of their graves. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the hosts of heaven, which they have loved, and which they have served, and after which they have walked, which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. So conquerors would ransack all the tombs to gain treasures and then humiliate the Jews by scattering the bones of the rich and honored in open spaces as a tribute to the superiority of their gods. And this chapter connects right with the last chapter in chapter 7. And the rotten corpses in the valley, even their bones would be disgraced. And in verse 3, it says, Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. So life in exile will be so traumatic that even death would seem better and a welcome relief. And survivors of the Babylonian invasion would be forced refugees exiled out of the promised land into the foreign lands. And in verse 4, Moreover, you shall, you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? So Jeremiah spoke of the natural instinct of one who falls gets back up and one who leaves to return. But Judah did not possess this instinct. And in verse 5, why has this people slidden back Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. So Jerusalem, we see, showed no signs of repentance. In verse 6 and 7, I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course. As the horse rushes into battle, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow. Observe the time of their coming, but my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. So many were determined to go their own way as determined and as energetic as a horse is as it rushes into battle. In verse 7, the instinct of the migratory birds led them to unfailing regularity to return every spring from their winter homes. But God's people will not return through the winter of divine wrath is arriving. And birds here, where I live in Massachusetts, they're actually going to be starting to head down south here any day now. I mean, we've been in the 80s, but the temperatures are going to start dropping in the next few weeks. So they're probably going to be heading out in the next couple of weeks. But God's people are ignorant of the season, and now they're worse off than the birds with small brains. So what I get out of verse 6 and 7 here is... Birds have small brains, but birds know when it's time to go south. They know the seasons here. Yet, God's people, in their sinful condition, they're, 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 they're like brain dead, basically. In verse 8 and 9, it says, how can, we, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? So the wise are a group 
perhaps the same group as the scribes. And it's likely that the oral traditions of some scribes here in Jeremiah's day distorted the law. And they were self-deceived, believing that they were wise and obedient. And God reminded Judah that not all who study and teach the word of God do so honestly. And some of them use their pen to work falsehood, not truth. And in verse 9, the scribes' wisdom is empty, having no real knowledge of the Lord's word. And in rejecting God's word, they're rejecting wisdom. And the same was true about the scribes back in Jesus' day in Matthew 23, we see. In verse 10 and 11, says, Therefore I will give their wives to others, and their fields to those who will inherit them, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given a covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. So the true motive for false prophets is greed. And they pretended that society had no problem with God, that everything is handy and fine, and that God is at peace with them as they sought to grow in their popularity. And false prophets today, they work exactly the same thing. Their motive is greed and they're going to lie to god's people they're going to tell everybody they're even going to tell society you know oh god's happy with america they're going to falsely prophesy stuff like oh 2025 is going to be a year of prosperity so on and so forth and god would take what is dear to the people of judah and give it to others those things because they did not hold the word of the lord daily and in Jeremiah, he points back here, back to chapter 6, verse 13 through 15, to the selfish corruption becoming part of life in Judah, that it could be said that everyone who deals falsely and yet weren't all ashamed. And Judah needed to hear this, no doubt, this message again. And verse 12 and 13 says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. In the time of their punishment they shall be cast down, says the Lord. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the vine, no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade in the things I have given them, shall pass away from them. So as a moral and cultural rot was among the deep among the people of Judah, God promised to bring a thorough judgment. And like a grapevine or a fig tree picked clean, God promised to surely consume them. And the vine here symbolizes Judah. And in Hosea chapter 2 verse 8 and 9, the language of no grapes on the vine also suggests a loss of fertility, a blessing of God that the people attributed to other gods. They gave credit in the wrong places. And they personally suffered the covenant curses. In verse 14, why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter the fortified cities. And let us be silent there, for the Lord our God has put us to silence and given us water of gall to drink, because we have sinned against the Lord. So the prophet imagined God's people fleeing to the fortified cities as the Babylonian invaders entered the land. And when the invading army came, they would also understand the greatness of their sin. But by then it would be too late. In verse 15, we looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and there was trouble. So the people heard and they believed the messages of the false prophets of peace, peace, when there was really no peace. And the deceived looked for what they got. And that's one thing you must understand when it comes to the false teachers and false prophets. People aren't just victimized because... Um, people aren't just victimized because, you know, they're 100% victims. A lot of people have itching ears, and they will seek what they want to hear. 
they they want you know a build my own type god of prosperity good you know perfect health and all that In uh, verse 16, it says, The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the nighting of his strong ones. For they have come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. So the territory of the tribe was on the northern border of the land where the invasion would begin and sweep south. And instead of peace, the Babylonian invaders come with snorting horses and an army so big that the whole land trembled. In verse 17, For behold, I will send serpents among you, vipers which cannot be charmed, and they shall bite you, says the Lord. So we see a figurative uh, picture of the Babylonian victors here in verse 17. And some see this as literal as some kind of plague in uh, verse 18 19 i would comfort myself in sorrow my heart is faint in me listen the voice the cry of my daughter of my people and from a far country is not the lord in zion is not her king in her why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols so with desperation, Jeremiah prophetically saw the tragedy that followed upon the devastating Babylonian invasion. And in verse 19, we see the cry of the exiled Jews that will come after they are taken captive into Babylon. And they will wonder why God would let this happen to the land and people. And Jeremiah wonders if God had left his own land and if he still reigned as king in Zion. And the problem is, is that it wasn't God who neglected Israel. It was Israel that neglected God. In verse 20, the harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. So the false confidence of Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 10 has been shattered by unfolding events. And summer was a season for growing, ending with harvest. And it should be a time of abundance and fulfillment. And here in the United States, our meteorological or our uh, calendar for summer ends actually two days from now, Sunday morning. And we see here in this verse a sad lament of conquered Judah where there's no abundance and they weren't saved. So they had a pretty horrible summer. You could use that analogy. In uh, verse 21, 22 says, For the hurt of my daughter, of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? So we see the chapter ends here with the coming devastation being compared to hopeless, hopeless anguish when harvest time has passed. But people are still in desperate need. And Jeremiah identified with his people's sufferings as a man of tears but saw a doom so pronounced that there was no remedy to soothe it. And there was no healing balm, the kind of abundance that was in Gilead, east of the Sea of Galilee, and no doctor to cure. And in Ezekiel 18.23, it says that the Lord does not delight in the judgment of the wicked. And Jeremiah saw that the herd of his people in exile, but no help for them. There was no medicine, no doctor, only sadness and mourning. So this is, you know, at the end of the chapter here, we see why Jeremiah gets his label of being the weeping prophet. And so tonight we see no cure for a senseless rejection of God by the disgraced remnants of those fallen in the judgment. And in verse 30, we see that death is chosen rather than life because of the conditions. 
in verse 4 through 7, we see Judah's stubborn folly with refusal to return. In verse 8 and 9, shows us the folly of rejecting the word of the Lord. Verse 10 through 13, shows us the judgment to come upon those who reject the word of the Lord. And in verse 14, we see the fleeing to the fortified cities under the judgment of God. In verse 15, 17, we see the looking for peace, but finding trouble. In verse 18, 19, gives us a vision of Judah in exile. And verse 20, shows the despair of conquered Judah. And the chapter, it ends with Jeremiah's pain filled with question. And that's going to wrap up tonight's video. We'll see you back tomorrow as we look at the ninth chapter, looking at what to take glory in. So I hope that you have a great rest of your evening up ahead and a great weekend up ahead. God bless.